uh, yeah, it's a good thing that we can record. We're gathering in this way, in a uh, way still to join the program and stay connected. So I'm so glad to see so many faces back this evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stacy McClendon. I am a teacher at Common Ground Meditation Center and uh, had this vision for this space before the trial started, anticipating all of the tension and angst uh, for my own heart and wanted the support at this intersection of my relationships with people, Sangha, and the, the teachings of the Buddha. And so how to be held in this place when the world is on fire, my heart is enraged and still meet the moment with equanimity and balance and clarity and move forward and do good. So of that, the Truth and Justice Vigil was born and I, uh, in collaboration with Ayo Yatunde, reached out to um, many wise and beautiful teachers that I got to meet at the gathering for um, African descended Buddhist teachers a couple of years ago, uh, the largest gathering of its kind here in the West. And Dr. Shante Paradigm Smalls was one of the sweet, sweet souls that I got to meet and spend time with. So I reached out to them and they graciously, eagerly said yes. Uh, they would join us here. And so, so happy to have you, uh, Dr. Small. Just a little bit about Dr. Small. Uh, they've been Buddhist practitioners, students since the age of 17, has practiced in Zen, Soko Gakkai, and has been authorized to teach in the Shambhala lineage uh, and in Buddha Dharma for many years. Um, they are teacher and on online as we all are now, but on Liberate and leads a weekly Dharma gathering, which they co-founded and curated. And Dr. Smalls really has the passion and commitment to teaching communities of color, LGBTQ communities. Um, and again, at this intersection of our identities, our social identities and Dharma. So, so, so happy to have you joining us from West East Coast. Most of, a lot of those Dharma teachers you know <laughs> sorry, come from the West Coast. But Dante is representing East Coast. So happy to have you and so glad that you all are back, even though we are post verdict. Um, just a matter of our difference and distance that arises therein, particularly around race, continues to be very much alive. Black folks are continuing to be killed every day by uh, police, and not all officers are being held accountable. So I appreciate your willingness and courage to keep showing up uh, for practice and dialogue. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Shante Paradigm Small. Thank you so much, um, Stacey, uh, for your uh, um, lovely invitation. Um, and thank you all. It looks like I'm looking up because I'm looking at my monitor. I'm not looking at my laptop. So I <laughs> have, my, have my setup, my fancy setup here. Um, thank you all for, um, for showing up. Um, weekly or whenever you can. And I just feel so grateful to know that this space is here and that um, so many of the teachers that have uh, been on it and will be on it are people I know or and or respect and uh, love. Um, and I just want to um, just take a moment to thank my teachers, Lama Rod Owens and Lama Justin Von Bojos um, for their you know guidance and their um, their heart. And I am feeling very, um, very inspired by the, by the existence of um, emergent sanghas, you know, as someone who is no longer, uh, I'm part of a lineage, but I am no longer part of a, 
a center or any any Buddhist organization, then I find myself practicing with emergent sanghas, um, you know, a group of friends and I practice once a month together. Uh, I teach and practice with weekly Dharma gathering. I teach and practice with my teachers, their sangha, Bumi Sparsha, and, and whoever else. And now with a common ground meditation center. So I feel really grateful um, for um, these continued lessons around um, emergence and around um, community of practitioners and around community in general and, and, and learning um, more and more uh, what that's about. So tonight, um, if you would allow me, I'd like to offer you a practice um, that I have found very um, helpful. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about it and then um, I can put it in the the chat um, and I'll also share it on screen so that people as I, it's a practice that I could I could walk you through so that you can just um, relax and you can also it's a practice where you can lay down so um, if, if that appeals to you uh, um, so this practice comes from so I'm a Vajrayana Buddhist a tantric Buddhist I'm in that lineage coming from the Indo Himalayan um, tradition and then the Tibetan diaspora um, and so um, these teachings, particular teachings come from um, a cycle of teachings that the Buddha gave to a, uh, the historical Buddha gave to a, um, a leader, a king of, uh, of a certain part of Tibet, uh, where he really saw the teachings of the Buddha being beneficial, but he was like, I don't want to be a monastic. I'm not trying to do all that. I want to, I want to be uh, able to um, benefit my people and lead. And so these come from a cycle of teachings called the Kala Chakra um, uh, from sort of in the Buddhist lineage. And then they also merge with the, with the Bun and sort of more um, secular, although the uh, uh, indigenous religion, um, as well as secular teachings that come through the, uh, the Tibetan Bun religion. And then the Shambhala, um, teachings, which also come from the Kala Chakra, which are teachings on, um, on uh, like secular teachings that are about um, leadership and about community and about um, uh, a container for a Buddhist practice. And so this practice is, its official name is called Ground Lungta. And so Lungta is a word that relates to um, it's the translation in English would be wind horse, um, but lungta is like, like it's sound. It's L U N G T A. Um, so it's about wind. It's about energy, like the lung. It's about our wind channel. And there are two ways that uh, in this particular practice, there are a lot of lungta, a lot of wind horse practices. This particular practice either can be done to kind of rouse your energy when you're feeling kind of physically or mentally or emotionally, um, though not clinically, kind of more depressed, more on the uh, depressive side, or it can be to, um, it can be to, uh, it can be to calm you if you're feeling a little bit, um, uh, feeling anxious, anxious energy. So I like to call this guided rest. And it relates, it relates to the soma, to so somatic practice. It's a, uh, visualization practice and it's a it's a hearing practice so I'm gonna put it in the chat and then I'll and then I'll um, also share my So I'm going to invite you to um, uh, lay down if you would like uh, and relax or get into any comfortable position that feels good for you, but a relaxed position. So we're not going to be doing shamatha. So you don't need to be in lotus or 
or diamond shape or cross-legged position, although you can. You can also stand if that feels comfortable. Um, you can lie on your side or on your back or in your front, or you can just sit where you are comfortable. First, just coming into um, a relationship with the earth. I'm calling, um, I'm zooming in from uh, Canarsie, Munsee, Lenape, Hoking territory. Um, also known as Brooklyn, New York. And this earth and this land is very uh, precious to me. It's very energetic. It is um, one of my teachers, the land, and it is filled with both um, incredible sorrow and violence and incredible love and energy and creativity, both in the contemporary sense and historically. And so just feeling my relationship to my feet and my seat with this land, letting gravity do its work. Feeling into the back of my, my body as well. Sometimes we forget about the back of our body. Starting with my heels and just working my awareness through my shins, the backs of my knees, the backs of my legs and thighs, the buttocks, the lower back and all of the organs, the middle back, the ribs, lungs, the upper back, the backs of my arms, the back of my neck, the back of my head, the back of my ears, the top of my head, and then feeling the front part of my body Letting the front of my body melt and be soft. And then feeling the space all around me and above me. So if the earth is mother, the sky is father and siblings, the planets, the stars, the other beings, the detritus, the meteors, and then feeling this space at this kind of bodily level, the space around me and near me and behind me and the room I'm in, and then a little bit extending outwards to the my neighborhood or my town, city, and so forth. begin the practice. Lay down, relax. And you can close your eyes or have them be soft, however you want. And we're gonna focus on four areas of the body. Bringing my awareness and my attention to my feet. feeling the whole foot, heel, sole, toe, tops and side of the feet, the ankle, and really all the way, the shins and the calves, all the way to right below the knee. This part of the body is related to the tiger and the tiger who lives particularly in the jungle who is uh, humble or meek meaning the tiger knows its place it's not trying to be a bird or a mouse or a jaguar or an elephant 
it is content with its power and its ability to move through the world without causing fanfare or attention to itself. It doesn't say, I'm a tiger roar. It knows its power. It moves silently on the floor of the jungle or climbing to a tree. And this part of our body is related to the principle of exertion. The paramita of exertion. And of course, moving forward with a kind of diligence and gentle consistency. Bringing our awareness to the hara or the middle part of our body. So our knees, our legs, our thighs, front and back, the middle body, our genitals, up to our belly. Sort of the largest part of this work, including the back of the body, the buttocks, and the lower back. all of the organs, guts, stomach, the sex organs, the small and large intestines, and so forth. This part of the body is related to the lion, but not the lion of the savanna, the snow lion of the mountain who leaps and lives in the mountaintop, warring and leaping with a sense of uh, perkiness and delight. This is a white lion, like snow, the snow lion. And this part of the body is related to fire, but like white hot fire, white, blue fire, discipline, but also delight, creativity, connection, connecting energy, and compassion that's directed and connected toward other people and other beings. So compassion in the sense of co-experiencing, co-suffering, going through together, experiencing together, supporting one another. Now we move our awareness and attention to our chest and arms. So, feeling that energy through our chest, our back, our biceps, our elbows, the crease of our elbows, our wrists, our forearms, our fingers, our palms. This part of the body is related to a fantastical animal called the Garuda. The Garuda is like a combination of tiger, sorry, <laughs> eagle, human, and phoenix, and is a bright red color, the color of blood, the color of a deep red sunset, red brilliance. And it's related to the principle of having confidence in equanimity. So the Garuda lives in the sky. It doesn't have to land anywhere. It has a bird's eye view of the stream that flows into the river that flows into the ocean. So it understands cause and condition, it sees those things arise 
abide and then dissolve. So it has confidence in that process of equanimity, not having a preference for this or that, but rather being able to work with all of it. The Garuda is also related to embracing what's happening. And this doesn't mean being happy about it or being sad about it or liking it, disliking it, but just saying this is happening, this is reality. And that energy that's in our chest and our arms, in the back of our body, in our fingertips, is attracts helpful beings, ancestors, helpful ancestors, helpful teachers, helpful friends, helpful communities that aid us in building the world that we want to see. So we call that drala in Tibetan or um, it literally translates as above the enemy or higher one. Moving energy and awareness and attention to our head and our shoulders. So the tops, the top of the chest, the top of the shoulders, the triceps, the throat, the neck, the back of the head, almost all of our sense perceptions are in this little bowling ball on top of our neck. Right, hearing, taste, smell, sight, touch is located throughout the entire body. And this part of the body is related to the dragon, um, the blue black dragon. And not really the dragon of the West that needs to be slayed, but really the dragon of the East and the dragon really of the universe that is uh, lives nowhere and appears wherever it is needed because it's related to the quality of prajna, of universal deep insight, of um, absolute wisdom, of our wisdom body and our wisdom mind that is spontaneous and arises from our practice. And this dragon is like the deepest, the color of the deepest sea or the deepest space and is related to knowledge, wisdom, riches, strength, generosity. And as we're feeling into our body, I'm just going to say a little mantra. Within my body, I have this incredible confidence, contentment, which is located at the feet and legs. Within my body, I have this incredible confidence, joy, which is related to the middle part of our body, from our knees to our belly, front, back, and side. Within my body, I have this incredible confidence, equanimity, which is related to the chest and the arms, front, side, and back. Within my body, I have this incredible confidence, wisdom, which is related to the head and the shoulders, front, side, and back. Hmm. And now we'll go to the, if you'd like, you can just continue to rest and listen, or you can um, say with me these seed syllables, ki and so. Ki and so are related to absolute confidence. And then the tantric 
not just the tantric tradition and Buddhism in general, there are these words that are seed syllables. So you may know the word om or whom or ah. And those seed syllables are contain the deepest wisdom of the Dharma. And they are usually also related to particular figures or energy. Om, for instance, is, is said to be the seed syllable of humanity. So ki and so are seed syllables from the Tibetan language that are related with uh, ki is absolute, our absolute wisdom, and so is our relative wisdom, how we work with that. So focusing on the areas again, feet and legs, ki ki, middle body, so, so, chest and arms, ki ki, head and shoulders, so, so, I'll do it again two more times, feet and legs, ki ki, middle body, so, so, chest and arms, ki ki, head and shoulders, so, so, feet and legs, ki, ki, middle body, so, so, chest and arms, ki, ki, head and shoulders, so, so. Visualizing the orange tiger at your feet and legs, the white snow lion in your middle body, the red Garuda in your chest and arms, the blue dragon in your head and shoulders. Letting them each, starting with the tiger, dissolve into your heart center, which is like a bright, brilliant sun. So first the tiger, the confidence of the tiger, meekness, and humility and contentment dissolves into your heart. Then the snow lion, the white lion, joy, the red Garuda, equanimity dissolving into your heart. And then the blue dragon, Prajna wisdom, and feeling that light and those qualities radiate throughout your entire being, illuminating every corner of your body from your head to your feet, from your front to your back and letting that light radiate out into space as far as it will go, touching and healing all those beings it impacts. And then saying the celebratory phrase, Ashe Gelo, which really is a cultural phrase that is a phrase of victory, of achievement, of confidence, victory over aggression, victory over passion, victory over ignorance. Kiki, so, so, ashe, la, gya, lo. Kiki, so, so, ashe, la, gya, lo. Kiki, so, so, ashe, la, gya, lo. And then if you'd like, we can close just with the first part of the return, the dedication of merit. By this merit, may all attain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. And then just start to become aware of where you are, your room or your environment, slowly coming back to the moment and more conscious awareness of you and your environment, as slow as you need to take it. If you want or need to stretch, you want to just feel whatever you're feeling and stay in that space, that's 
welcome as well. I'm also going to put in the chat the um, visualization, the symbols, the C syllables of key and so, if you would like those. And I'll also share them on the screen really quickly. Um, sometimes we, people learn through various methods. So this is key. This is so. So this is absolute, our absolute wisdom and our absolute kind of competence. And you could say this absolute bodhicitta, you could say, and this is relative. He and so. <sighs> um, so I, I'd like to Say if you, if this practice feels helpful and feels like something you would like to do, it doesn't have to be that long. You can kind of, you can kind of just, you can do it in the morning if you if you feel a little depressed or anxious or at night um, or anytime, and it can be very quick. But I like to let people fall asleep, <laughs> so it's yours to practice. Um, to your, um, or not, but um, I wanted to just offer that. And um, now um, I think open up to any comments or questions or experiences that you might wanna share. And I, I'm also happy to talk about um, how this can help in relation to work that we or one may be doing um, because uh, body-based practices help to process work that we're doing and trauma uh, or vicarious trauma, like we've all experienced when we hear about or you know watch videos or whatever of, or experience um, state violence, uh, and, and violence that is encouraged by uh, white supremacy. Um, the body takes a longer time to process than the mind. It moves at a different pace. So these body-based practices can help us get in touch. That can be a, you know, it can be a two-edged, double-edged sword, double -edged sword, but it helps to move some of this through our somatic experience and it helps to balance the parasympathetic and the um, sympathetic nervous system so that we're not always in fight flight or freeze and it also helps to when you know it's a actually a great practice when you're experiencing rage because it's like oh yeah i have i'm feeling rage and i'm also this this rage is is um wisdom arising i just don't exactly know how to use it right or relate to it So I'm here for you. Shante, I wonder if you would be willing to say more about uh, rage or anger as wisdom arising. And it seems that it takes quite a bit of awareness and skill in that moment. And then the heart is a flame. It can be uh, difficult to have some present moment awareness and use that energy skillfully. I wonder if you can say a bit more about how this, how one might use this practice to get a grip. Yeah. So there are many great teachings on using the energy of anger and rage. If I may, Lama Rod, uh, great book um love uh, love and rage using anger it's right over here use it's like using anger to wake up something like that so love and rage is a great book and there are many also traditional teachings particularly in the tantric tradition on this energy 
but in fact, it's also, it's related to this, this practice of wind horse, not this particular individual practice, but the principle of wind horse, which is <clears throat> generally learning how to ride the energy that's arising and not have it kind of ride you into the ground. So I think it's a very different kind of um, model than trying to either repress your anger, which can lead to anything from um, you know, depression to uh, physical illness, to emotional illness, mental illness, headaches, <clears throat> or a disassociation. So there's a model, particularly in the West, of trying to repress anger um, or um, control it and then use it as a weapon, right? Where you just, you're just a wild horse kicking everyone in the head. <clears throat> but this, this practice and other practices are about relating to what's arising and thinking of and relating to anger as an, a natural energy, a natural energy source. <laughs> and anger is uh, an emotion that we are meant to feel and experience. And it can, is often likened to fire. So we know fire, <laughs> if, we not, if we didn't learn how to use fire properly, we wouldn't be here. But also we know that we know fire's destructive possibilities. So anger and even rage itself is neutral. How do we use it? How do we relate to it? And this question of skillful means is a very serious one and it's not something that can be taught, it has to be learned. It can be pointed out, but not taught, as they say. Because we each have to learn through our own embodied experience how to relate. For some of us, anger is very scary. For some of us, it feels very powerful. For some of us, it feels both of those things. Some people have really no relationship with anger. Some people's relationship with anger is too intimate. And so it, it, there's really a holistic relationship that we have to develop with all of our emotions and energy states. And something that I see happen as a, as a Dharma teacher, as a Dharma practitioner, as a Dharma student, as a human being, particularly in the West, particularly in a lot of white dominated Dharma spaces is that there's this idea that practice, being a practitioner means being nice. My experience is that kind and nice are very different. Kindness sees the whole picture. And sometimes kindness is, I think of kindness as a synonym for, synonym for love and kindness is sometimes a very firm no. Like a parent stopping a child from walking into oncoming traffic. And that's not, sweetie, don't do, you know? It's firm, it's deliberate, and it's sometimes even loud. And so if we don't relate to the energy of anger, we can't actually wake up. Because we have to be able to use whatever we're given as a tool to wake up and wake up, help others to awaken. So we can, we can do that in shamatha practice. We see we're in our sitting practice and we feel the energy of anger coming up. And instead of trying to like let bliss in or whatever, I don't know, whatever people do, you know, let in with calm, out with bad. It's like, we actually, there's our wisdom arising. Ooh. And so we feel that. And maybe we feel it to our, to our edge, right? We don't like it because we have an idea of ourselves or we like it too much. You know? And so it's an energy we have to learn how to ride and we have to develop a relationship 
So a relationship that's healthy is not one of dominance or one of um, over-reliance, it's one of mutuality. So we don't wanna be afraid of our anger and we don't wanna weaponize it, we wanna to relate to it. Because underneath every emotion, particularly when people say like negative emotions, right? Is wisdom is trying to get out and it's using whatever root it has to get our attention. And so this view, this worldview comes from my training in Tantra, which is that everything is used for, everything is sacred. Everything is used for, for awakening. And it's, it can be a little, it can be quite dangerous. So we have to ground ourselves, right? Ground ourselves in the earth, ground ourselves in our practice, you know, ground ourselves in a community, ground ourselves in the Dharma, ground ourselves in a relationship with a teacher, you know, so that we're not fooling ourselves and thinking that we're doing something when we're actually causing trouble. And the, how can we test this? Well, we can see how, how it goes, you know, how are our relationships when we work with anger? How do we um, When it arises, what do we do with it? I, I, I can tell you, I've experienced this all the time at in work. And I can, you know, I experience this um, rage around um, structural and systemic white supremacy that is so pronounced in my work and the bullshit that. Um, that happens to me, but really actually that I see happen to a lot of other people, particularly um, black women. And as a trans person who's masculine of center, I, I, get, I get a lot of leeway. I, I mean, it's interesting. I get, I'll, I benefit from masculine, even though I'm not male or a man, I benefit from that masculine privilege. I mean, it's very different than, the black women I work with and how they're treated. And the kind of the anger, I'm, I'm constantly yeah, the angry black person, you know? And I feel it in my body, you know? And that's not even to speak of the violence that I see from the police that I've experienced, that my brothers have experienced, you know? We, the way that cops terrorized us in our lives. And so the, the practice is not denying these things as factors, but not letting the anger burn me up. Um, but, but letting it, um, letting it reveal and um, refine me. And so that's, that's slow work, that's hard work. That's not only in a Dharma, that's not work only done in a Dharma setting, you know? Um, so I think, you know, that's what I would, would say on that. And the, um, because at first to me, when we start to work with strong emotions, we first have to ground in our body and in, in our experience and our reality. If you feel shy about asking a question on camera, you are welcome to write one in the chat as well. Yes, hi. Such a great question. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your experience. So I think, you know, you said kind of two things that I think uh, contains like the sort of the antidote, which is one is like when anger when the feeling of anger arises and it brings you to the past, right? Your upbringing, or it brings you to the future, like how to win an argument. Grounding in the body helps you to come into your the present and mm. just feel that energy of the anger, mm. right? Before trying to kind of rely on a habitual pattern, right? Or uh, 
that was that was taught to you as a young person or to rely on a habitual, habitual pattern that makes you feel powerful, right? Mm -hmm. And so for just feeling it in, like going, like saying, okay, head, I know you're there and you're ready to, the mind is, is job, the mind's job is to find and solve problems. No problem, right? That's what it does. <laughs> That's like, it, it, you know, let it do its job, but it's like, but okay, you don't have to, this is not for you. And it's not exactly the brain, but it's, not, but come back, bring it back into the body. You, Cause you can kind of feel that, like whatever you feel, right? However that feels for you, you know, that familiar feeling. And maybe come back and bring it in, come back into the body and, and locate where you're feeling anger in your body. And then what that is bringing up for you. Hmm. It may be fear, it may be sadness. It may be a feeling of helplessness. It may be frustration it may be violence whatever but but right and then on the kind of more conceptual side or theoretical side in terms of skillful means like how we work with difficult emotions the first so the four karmas of skillful means the first one the last one is what you said the last one is cutting or destroying or kind of reorienting with a, you know, the first one is pacifying. First, we have to pacify ourselves, right? mm -hmm. to pacify the wildness in our mind. That's what sitting, that's what our, what basic sitting practice is for, passive, you know, stabilizing, cl clarifying, and strengthening the mind so that when something, that everything doesn't make send us into a wild tizzy. So the first one is, first is pacifying. And once we've, and I would say 85, 90% of situations can be dealt with, with first bringing the temperature of things in ourselves with others down. Mm. Bringing that down produces clarity. Bringing the high, you know, energy down begins to produce some clarity. And the second of the skillful means is then we is um enriching what can we bring to a situation how do our how is our particular skill set can be used so it's like that sharp um prajna mind of yours they, it always has a neurotic quality and a wisdom quality so beginning to cultivate the wisdom quality rather than the neuro neurotic quality and so that sharp prajna mind, the diamond like mind is the one that can see, right? Very deeply and also can see lots of different facets. So we don't have to go for the easy answer. We can, we can let it simmer, right? We can turn down the boiler and let the fire simmer, mm -hmm. right? Cook that, make that beautiful, yummy reduction, right? By not boiling, but letting it simmer, right? So we enrich the third principle of skillful working with skillful means is then magnetizing. Then, then we draw people to us through that process. We've pacified, we've enriched the situation, and then we start to magnetize. So a lot of times magnetic people, you know, use their powers for evil. You know what I mean? But we can use that magnetizing quality. You know, when you experience like a really good, you know, Dharma teacher or something, or a really good singer and actor, and they are, they're, they're, you're, they're right there with you, you know? And it's not oppressive, but it's a kind of, it's a kind of drawing in that makes you feel both held, uplifted and inspired. So this, mm -hmm. that quality. And then sometimes we have to use the, the fourth, you know, which is represented by the, the four arms of, of of Mahakala and, and in this fourth arm, he has this sword. And then sometimes we actually need to, you know, cut or destroy. So we need to destroy the system of white supremacy. We need to destroy patriarchy. We need to destroy, um, you know, um, homophobia. We need to destroy classism. Those systems need to be destroyed, but not just blown up and then something else 
just as bad takes its place, but skillfully destroys. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that uh, dissolved is the way I've been thinking about. We need to dissolve those systems, right? So the abolition movement that is in this country is not just abolition of uh, enslavement, qua enslavement, but it's afterlife, which we're still dealing with, you know, through jails, policing, uh, educate, you know. Yeah. So how do we how do we dissolve these systems? So first we've but we've got to we've got to do all that. We got to pacify, enrich, and magnetize to be able to destroy. You know, so so it's I think it's those two things like don't leave your body, mm -hmm. feel, and then really make like like the prajna wisdom is is trying to arise um, because you have some solutions to offer, but it's not the snaps, it's not the snap judgment, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. that's very short sighted. I'm going to win an argument. Mm -hmm. It's more like. It's more expansive and it includes more people. Hmm. Yeah, so it's sort of like, um, it's like a cycle. So it's like a phenomena arises. It can be a thought, that can be an emotion, that could be an action, right? So something arises in space. And it's it arises from wherever, it abides and then it dissolves. But, <laughs> when it arises and when it abides, when it dissolves, all kinds of things can then happen, right? In our relationship to that, depending on if we like it or not. And so we can get, a, let's say a thought arises and it's very seductive. You know, a thought arises in our meditation. We're like, ooh, okay, wow. And then we're like chasing that thought, right? But it's just, it's just a phenomenon. We've had a zillion of those happen. And so when we have a relationship where we're like participating in our lives, but we're not, we're not making conditions, right? So it's not that equanimity doesn't mean I don't care, you know, oh, I'm free, nothing, uh, everything's, nothing bothers me. I get hit in the head with a hammer whatever, you know, <laughs> someone else gets in the hammer, whatever, you know, hit the head with hammer. It's that we don't say life's not fair. Dang it. Okay. I'm not going to participate in life. It's we feel that it pain and we orient ourselves even more deeply to the causes and conditions that cause that to arise and we want to heal the causes and conditions right so i'll say this way this is why it's tricky to talk about you know reform because let's say if the judicial system or the policing system because it has to get at the root causes and the root cause you know how do you reform the slave patrol that has never stopped being a slave patrol and just incorporate it like, you know, it was a way for um, historically in the US for the Irish in particular and then, then Italians to show, prove that they were white. To, it was the induction, it was one of the jobs that Irish men and later Italian men could hold um, that would guarantee them also uh, along with um, fighting in the, in the, uh, during the civil war in the Union Army access to whiteness. You, know, you can read about it in how the Irish became white. You can read about it in whatever. So it was already a ploy because the Irish and the Italians were considered, when they came to the US, they weren't considered white, they were considered not exactly black, but more <laughs> closer to black. And they had to um, degrade others in order to as admission into whiteness, right? So that hasn't gone away. And so in, the, in Buddhism, in mindfulness, in awareness, we try to deal with getting to the root of things in order to liberate. 
So it's a very anti-American kind of, you know, we're like, slap a, cut it off, slap, slap a Band-Aid on that gaping wound. Um, holistic, no, I don't, that's, that's woo-woo, right? Looking at a whole system, no, that's too, that's, how am I gonna make money off of that? So the space arrive, the space is there. We just begin to experience it differently, right? So our, maybe when you first start, at least my experience wasn't, in, you know, when you first, when I first started meditating, it was like, it was, I never experienced a gap. It felt like all of my thoughts and emotions and physical sensations were just, and then I noticed, oh, this is teeny tiny little, and I kind of slid into that gap. And now I experience that space. It's the same space that was always there. I just, I experience it differently. I experience space. So I never thought my mind felt so wild. And now it's, I experience much. I experience the space. The space was not created. It was always there. But my experience was that I was oriented toward the thoughts, toward the phenomena. So if you think about it as a dot in space, we're obsessed with the dot. <laughs> we're, we're obsessed with the dot. And forget the space is wisdom. Right? Space is, you have to have space for wisdom to arise. So if there's no space, then it's just, everything just gets jammed up and, right? So the arising is like the action, but the space around it is what helps us to orient, how am I gonna to relate to this, this dot? And dots are always arising. The train is going by, y'all are here, we're here, the lights, camera action, my dog is snoring, the fan is, all kinds of things, birds, everything is happening. And so we hold our space in that. And sometimes then, once we are, um, have the clarity, stability, and strength, then we can begin to act from that place and act with, um, you know, wisdom. And sometimes we need to use our anger as a sword. And sometimes we need to use it to warm someone up. Sometimes we need to use it to defrost. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we use it to cook. The, it, it's not, we don't know all the answers, but we begin to develop and cultivate that prajna quality of our mind so that we can begin to, and then we connect with others and we begin to use our collective prajna. We start waking up together and we start, you know, we build, we build things like this that Stacy and Ayo have built and that you and many and me and many other people now benefit from. That's prajna arising. That's not saying, oh, can't do anything it's 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 like juicy and so the spaces and spaciness it's possibility it's like when you walk into a new home that was created out of space <laughs> and then you walk into it and you imagine how you're going to orient furniture and in the space right so, but the space has to be there first, right? So then, and then we begin to relate to that rather than only relating to the, the things that are arising in our mind and in our, in our world. That's what I would say. I also want to encourage people to be you know, gentle with themselves. So sometimes so we're dealing with very deep, long global systems. Um, and I kind of just say to myself, oh right, this won't be resolved in my lifetime, but I'm wanna be I want to build on what was I inherited, you know, the work that many, many people have done that sometimes gets erased, um, but that we can 
rediscover and build on those abolition principles and wisdom traditions and um, remember that the world wasn't always like this, right? And that, um, and that imagining both in the past and in the future that the present can actually be um, radically different. And that we begin to push back on the way that let's say media and governments try to manipulate us into staying asleep or they threaten us you know, with violence. And but so like really imagining the work that I'm doing as being that something someone a hundred years from now is going to benefit from as, as well, like seeing it like that. Um, and that there's change that's been happening, you know? And that I get to be a part of. And then, you know, in this form I dissolve and things continue. So I think to, to not, you know, uh, I was reminded a couple of months ago at, at work and, and we do these, uh, sometimes we do these circles, transformative justice circles. It's really hard to do these at work, but, and someone said, you know, remember that speed is like a, is like a, the way they put it is speed is a, like a, a, like a legacy of white supremacy where everything has to get done now. Right, but it's also speed is part of um, aggression. Sometimes we need speed, and sometimes we don't. You know, so if we're always on speed, if we're always in karma energy, it's a, it's just too aggressive. We have that we're a very karma country. Do 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 do. No rest, no space. Right, only arising, only action, only action, and that doesn't. Um, that's not how relationships work. That's not how the body works. That's not how movements work. So sometimes it feels like the violence of the structure is because it's always there that we have to be, you know, but um, we also have to build structures that can um, push back and dissolve the, the hurtful, the harmful structures. And so we need each other, you know, to do that. So Tong Len is a very interesting practice because I, a lot of <laughs> a lot of people like Tong Len. I'm like, that's a real serious practice. So I mean, it's different than my tree, right? Um, so you know, my tree, loving kindness, and in, in many ways, that's like. Kind of sending loving kindness and but Tonglen practice is really about in my experience my view is really about uh, walking through hell together right because it's uh, because compassion in English literally means co-suffering so, I mean, a lot of times people think in other religions, like, oh, that's compassion, man. That's, but it's the same in Buddhism, you know? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the practice, it's the main practice of the bodhisattva, of the awakened being, is to take on the suffering of others so that they may to take on the suffering of others in this life and every life before and every life since so that others may achieve enlightenment and wake up before you. <laughs> and so Tonglen is one of these practices that really came about in, through the Tibetan tradition. Um, but Long Chempa, um, you know, they came out through these, um, these um, Lojong, um, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. They, they really were kind of, they were really kind of like solidified through those through the Lojong practices, but they really come out of, uh, you know, these these practices that were written about in the way of the Bodhisattva by Ashanti Deva, and so and he, you know, when he he's, he's sort of like a misogynist weirdo, but when he when you he, when he when you read the poetry of 
the way that we shot, but he's like, why did I say, why did I say yes to this? So the Tong Len practice is very interestingly, also a body and visualization practice that first begins with um, phenomena, environmental, just feeling the feeling of um, hot, cloistered, claustrophobic, choking, kind of like, and then feeling the, the antidote to that. So free, fresh, light, right? And then you get more specific with specific instances, people, you know, um, you, what you're, you can add, you know, yourself and then larger groups. So it's really a practice that requires first stability, clarity and strength. And you bracket that particular practice with sitting on either end. That practice actually can, Tang Len can be very upsetting. Um, but it also can be a practice that can help you process some rage and anger uh, in an embodied way because it is about like breathing it in, let imagining that you're it's transformed through the compassion that exists in your body and then uh, breathing out the solution, not just for yourself, but for those impacted and for the world. So that practice is very powerful in, in healing, but it also takes, it takes a lot from the practitioner. Um, but it is, it is a nice, it is a good way to work with um, rage. That's a very good practice and anger. It's not always rejuvenating, but it is um, very, it can very, it can transform your relationship to those confused feelings or those feelings of anger or feelings of, you know, murderous, whatever. Um, and I would always encourage people when you do Tonglen to sit a little bit before and sit a little bit after. Because it's, it's um, you're giving, you're sending and taking, you're giving of yourself and you're using your body, your energetic body, your physical body to transform suffering. So it's not always a restful practice. Um, but other practices for, for rest and rejuvenation that I would encourage people to do walking meditation. So being out in nature, I mean, for me is like, it's just like I'm, I'm plugging into the source. So really, I know it may sound a little woo-woo, developing a, a deep, deepening our connection with the earth and deepening our connection with the other beings. So I think walking meditation can be very rejuvenating because the focus there is on just the feeling of the legs and the feet as you're moving through the world and you're kind of just, you're taking it in and you're just enjoying it. You know, if, if, particularly if you have a kind of um, green space, but even if you don't have that, just uh, some of my best walking meditations has been in, you know, cities with incredible architecture, you know? So just, you know, um, so that can be very rejuvenating. Um, other rejuvenating practices can just be, you know, checking in with, touching in with like your, your Dharma siblings, you know, just having a nice conversation, a, a Zoom cup of tea if you can't be in person, but just maybe just having a cup of tea together, you know. Um, I like to just incorporate things into my practice that are part of my just lineage. So I listen to a lot of music. Sometimes that is my practice. I listen to gospel music, <laughs> you know? I listen to R&B, I listen to hip hop. And, you know, that, that gets me, those are my preliminary practices. Um, so whatever you find, I, I find cooking to be very rejuvenating and um, taking care of my plants and my dog. So, you know, talking to my plants, watering them, cleaning them. I'm like, why, why do plants get dusty inside? Anyway, so, you know, doing these things that are actually employ my mindfulness quality, but aren't like sitting meditation. So in the morning, like in the morning, you know, the first couple hours of the day are really mine. So it's like, I have a whole routine and I make, you know, my 
my chai and my water and open my shrine for the day. And those kinds of things make, I'm, I'm very into order and, you know, and I try to use my neurotic cleanliness as a med as a practice, as a mindfulness practice where I'm like finding joy in those things. So though I find those things incredibly rejuvenating, like just, I'm like, I'm drinking fresh water. I just bought these, I don't know what they're called, but they're these Japanese charcoal. So I was like, Britta's don't work, whatever. So, and I'm like, this water tastes amazing, <laughs> you know? And like, just put it in my tap water. I'm like, look, 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 you know, just the act of drinking water and looking out at the trees in the morning and listening to the birds and making my tea. And those things are rejuvenating. Um, So they don't, it doesn't have to be like a formal practice. It could, it could just be finding joy in the things that bring you joy, you know? So um, I am a, a serious, hardcore lover of dogs. Not just my own, my own dog, who I love, but I love every dog. <laughs> you know I mean? So it's like I, in the mornings when we're out in the dog, you know, we're out in the park and we see all the, I'm just like, I'm in heaven, you know, um, and I really feel a sense of, I feel, I feel so connected to the reality of bodhicitta, right, that of enlightenment, because I see these, there's a dog that um, is a, a fear aggressive dog, Amika, and I, I, I have a, I, who's also a pit bull mix, and I have a pit bull who's a therapy dog, he's very good. Her bad qualities are that she likes to murder squirrels. Okay. But other than that, she is an amazing, very good with humans, all humans, all animals. She's um, not squirrels, but cats. Um, but I had a dog, Talopa, who I named after. Anyway, it was my fault naming him that because he really taught me a lot of lessons, like the great Mahasiddha Talopa. And he was a fear aggressive dog. And um, you know, through the relationship with that dog, I learned a lot about my own neurosis, about my ego, about what it really takes to help a being heal from trauma. And this dog, Mika, she, the, their, her owners are like, oh, everyone sees her and thinks she's so bad. I was like, I can just clearly see she's fear aggressive. You know, she's like, my dog like shakes her head and Mika starts going crazy, you know? And I can see her suffering. She so desperately wants to play, but something in her mind is telling her she's in danger at all times. So we've over a year or two have developed a relationship and now she comes really close to us. You know, she tried to bite me today, but I just stood there. And then she was like, rolled on her back. I was like, girl, you don't know what you're doing. You don't, you, you're confused. But I was like, I identify. I've been there. I want to be close to you, but I want to bite you. And so these things, just our simple everyday life contains vast wisdom, vast lessons, so much joy um, and, and finding joy in that simplicity, you know, has really helped me. A cup of tea, it's really not just like some kind of stereotype, it's really true. Like a cup of tea or a glass of water or a well-made meal or, um, a nicely made bed can really uplift our mood and transform, um, you know, a bowl of popcorn in a funny movie can just transform our whole experience of, uh, of what it means to, to show up and be a human being that's trying to alleviate suffering of um, all beings. You know, there's, there, there's absolutely time for formal practice, you know, like totally. That's very, very important. But then what do we do in post-meditation? Meaning the rest of our lives. <laughs> you know, what do we do for the other majority, right? So it, you know, I can remember times when I was sitting, you know, and then I'd go outside and get into an argument with a stranger. <laughs> it's just like okay so then be, you know, beginning to have a different relationship and it just on its own begins to seep 
And so sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm a little too loose. I need to do the practices. My teacher told me, I just don't want to, you know, do it because it's like an hour and a half every day. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, but I'm like, okay, you know, and then it's, you know, I'm seeing it blossom, but we don't want to be so um, strict that then we never practice, you know? And so, you know, for me, it's like, when I have a sense of, I can practice anywhere, then my meditation, formal meditation seat becomes very, very attractive. And then I'm drawn to it. I want to sit, I long to sit rather than it being something I'm, you know, that's compulsory. So yeah, just, just, just do what works, you know? And I, I thank you um, everyone because um, your, you know, your practice and your showing up inspires me, you know, Common Ground is such an amazing, um, it's such an amazing place. And oops, where'd you go? I lost it all for a second. You know, these computers like, <laughs> um, and it's really inspiring to me that, um, you know, this, this work is happening and so much amazing work is happening. So thank you all for your, your practice and, um, Thank you for uh, hosting me. Uh, I hope to I miss Minnesota. I miss, I love Minneapolis. Uh, and I, I, I haven't had a chance to go to the Prince Museum yet. I was in Minneapolis when it opened, but I didn't get a chance to go. So I, I'll be there someday. Cause I, you know, Prince is my man. Um, and, uh, I, and I know y'all are holding a lot of pain in the heart of this country, you know? Um, and of course we know it's not just, you know, George Floyd, but so many incidents have happened in, you know, Ohio and, and, uh, Minnesota, <laughs> Ooh. um, you know, that whole region, Ohio, Minnesota, Indiana, there's so much, I mean, all, but there's just a lot of, a lot of pain emanating from that heart center. And, um, and so I just thank Common Ground for being a place where people can bring their, um, open broken hearts and and practice together and heal and 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 do this work. So I, I'm I'm hoping y'all get to open up safely at some point and um, but of course continue on Zoom, which is the safest. So thank you, thank you all for being here. Mm, thank you so much, Sante, for joining us and really being a light bring uh, great wisdom and laughter. And if laughter isn't part of the, the Dharma, then uh, we should reconsider. So uh, I, I appreciate that. And may uh, all of the good that uh, arose in our hearts and the wisdom, may that transform our hearts to meet suffering with great compassion and care. And may this practice radiate outwards and touch the lives and hearts of those that are close to us as well as those far away until all beings know the source of happiness and peace. And may it be so. Just a quick word to remind everyone um, that there is this great opportunity to support our guest teacher, Dr. Smalls. I like it. It just sounds good. So I'm just going to say it, Dr. Smalls, uh, uh, by offering uh, what you are moved and able to offer, Donna. Uh, Common Ground operates entirely on the generosity of people just like you. Um, and if you are interested, able, willing to support the livelihood of Dr. Smalls for their great wisdom and care, then you can visit the Common Ground Meditation Center website. There's a link in the chat and you can 
uh, look for the Truth and Justice Vigil and uh, find Dr. Small's name there and the Donna will go directly. Two thirds of the Donna offered will go directly to Dr. Small's Common Ground will retain one third for operations for the center, which will slowly be opening its doors uh, this summer in small ways. Okay. I also put my uh, link tree in if you want to, you know, uh, I have some podcasts and um, free podcasts and some YouTube videos and follow me on socials if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone. So good to be here with you. Uh, we're back again next Tuesday and we'll be here. Uh, Originally, we said for the duration, I think we imagined uh, the trials having some definitive end, uh, and there will be, uh, it's just not this year. So we'll for sure be here through the summer. Uh, and next week, um, Yoko Kane Barrett will be joining us back again. So oh, hopefully, yeah. Yay! <laughs> oh, wow. Ah. Yeah, so hopefully she'll lead us in some more chanting and yeah, great. So yeah. Keep coming back. So good to be with you all. Night. Thank you.